Welcome to class. Much of American history and politics revolves around the conflict between state and local governments and who has more power. If we recall the debate at the ratification of the Constitution between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, Federalists wanted a strong central government that could be extremely effective in moving through uh, each state the agenda that Congress and the President had set. Meanwhile, the Anti-Federalists feared that giving so much power to a central government would threaten the rights and privileges of individuals in smaller communities and would deprive states of the power that they, that they had traditionally had. So the debate between state and federal rule um, was uh, handled at the Constitutional Convention um, through what's called the writing of the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause in the Constitution very simply says that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. That means that no other law is ever higher than the Constitution. The job of the Supreme Court is to ensure that the Constitution is always uh, in force, that no law passed by Congress at the national level or any state at the local level can conflict with the United States Constitution. So ultimately, the federal government does have more authority than state governments. If there is ever a conflict between state and local uh, and national laws, national law will trump state and local law. But this hasn't always been easy. And we're going to look a little bit at the meaning of this and why we set it up this way. And we're also going to look at some examples of conflict between states and the national government. First of all, the reason that we have a supremacy clause is essentially we don't want states going rogue. We don't want states going off and just deciding to do entirely their own thing. The Civil War is a perfect example of states in the South that wanted to go a totally different direction. We had a serious divide over the issue of slavery between northern and southern states. Southern states were never going to be willing to get rid of slavery because it was a staple of the economic system of the plantation economy. Those who controlled southern politics, white male plantation owners, relied on slaves for their income, and they weren't willing to give up that money or that power. So, ultimately, there was a break, and the, the southern states left the country and cr tried to create their own nation, and that's why this is sometimes called by those in the south the war between the states. You see, each part of the country is divided into states. There is no part of the United States that is not part of some smaller territory. Almost everything is a state. We also have some territories like Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. Um, but in general, state laws apply within that state. If you're in California, state law applies, as long as it is consistent with federal law. So for example, the minimum wage. The federal minimum wage is seven fifteen an hour, seven twenty five an hour perhaps. Um, and many argue it should be higher. So if a state wants to, a state can create a minimum wage that is above $7.25 an hour. You can go higher than the federal minimum wage, but no state can ever go lower than the federal minimum wage. By the same token, uh, federal governments can pass certain standards in education. Uh, federal governments can say, we want states to make sure that uh, there is a certain book for every student. Well, states are in charge of education. The Constitution keeps education in the hands of the states. Nowhere in the Constitution is education even mentioned, which means that it's not delegated to the national government. So the only way that the federal government can influence states on issues like education is by offering money. If you want federal money for education, you have to do these things that we're asking you to do. If you don't want to do those things, fine, but you're not going to get federal money. Um, so the federal government maintains influence with states sometimes through offering money, uh, and states oftentimes will accept that money because they need it to help run certain programs. Um, but because every state is part of a whole, we are one nation. The national laws are always at a higher level than the local or state laws, and that's laid out by the Supremacy Clause. 
I've given um, the Civil War as one example of conflict between state and federal law. Another example that is also related to race is the integration fight. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that integration would become the law of the land. Brown v. Board of, Brown v. Board of Education was the landmark case, a civil rights case, in which the court ruled that segregated schools would be considered unconstitutional. Yet it takes into the 1960s and even the 1970s for some school districts across the South to actually comply with integration. Shortly after the Brown v. Board ruling in 1955, 1956, 1957, um, local authorities who were segregationists uh, and where white power was entrenched in places like uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, Birmingham, uh, places across the South, including here in North Carolina, didn't integrate their schools right away, even though the federal government, through the ruling in the Supreme Court on Brown, had spoken. So in those cases, a decision has to be made by the president, who's in charge with enforcing the laws, what are we going to do? President Eisenhower sent the National Guard into Little Rock, Arkansas, to help integrate uh, uh, Central High School there. So the federal government used its power in that case to force the state to comply with federal law. The Voting Rights Act um, has been instrumental in making sure that states at the local level don't discriminate in their voting laws against especially African Americans and Latinos and other minorities. Uh, but the Supreme Court recently ruled in this last year that some parts of the voting rights law are outdated, um, and the, the court then interprets the Constitution in different ways as the times evolve. We can agree or disagree on whether we like or dislike the court's rulings. Another example of conflict that has to do with state rights and state power is Obamacare, the national health care law that passed Congress several years ago with the support of Obama and Democrats. Very few Republicans supported this bill. Um, it creates a system that is designed to make health care more affordable for all Americans. Um, some states, mostly led by Republicans, have tried to avoid implementation of this law. One thing that Obamacare does is it expands Medicaid. It provides more dollars um, for states that provide uh, increased access to more families to Medicaid. Uh, North Carolina's governor, Pat McCrory, who's a Republican, has said, no, we don't want to do that. Um, so North Carolina is among a number of states that have actually turned down federal money because they don't want to implement um, this health care law. So, again, you see the conflict between state and federal law. Oftentimes this comes down to politics and a different view of the, what the role of government should be. Republicans tend to uh, want a smaller government uh, with fewer services and lower taxes. Democrats tend to be more willing to assess taxes in order to provide larger services. But federal supremacy is mandated by the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. No state or city or town or county is ever permitted to violate the Constitution of the United States. Have a great day. We'll check in later.